All right. Okay, I preach. I like to preach on Christmas uh, because I think a lot of people have... There's a lot to preach about Christmas. Sometimes I preach on the true story of Christmas, and I'll touch on that today. But today I want to focus more on, and I did the same last year, focus more on debunking objections to Christmas. Debunking objections to celebrating Christmas. And we'll talk about the different aspects of how people celebrate Christmas. And uh, the arguments out there that people say Christians shouldn't celebrate Christmas. Uh, For those of you in the room, you may not know, but there are Christians out there that think, you know, celebrating Christmas Christmas is wrong. It's actually wrong for Christians to do. They shouldn't. Uh, If you don't know Christians that believe that, you must know about the Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses also um, have this practice. This this does not mean they're necessarily uh, wrong in what they think, just because the Jehovah's Witnesses do that. But I'm just saying, the Jehovah's Witnesses are famous for, you know, believing that Christmas should not be celebrated, Easter should not be celebrated, birthdays should not be celebrated, anniversary, like all these things that people do, these yearly celebrations are pagan, they have pagan symbolism and all this stuff, and they think Christians ought not have anything to do with Christmas. So sometimes I like to balance out those views, if if any of you in the room may have these views. Um, I don't know, but if you've come across these views, I just want to argue the opposite. Uh, I'm personally not either for Christmas or against. Um, I think there is Christian liberty and whether or not people celebrate it, but I like to just debunk the objections just because I don't think the objections that are are normally raised by people, uh, to people that do celebrate Christmas, I don't think they're biblical, and I just like people having a biblical uh, view on Christmas, on things. But before we get into that, I just want to talk about nativity. We went through the story of Christmas. I always like to just get rid of some misconceptions about the nativity because whenever you see, you know, even at, uh, you know, Carnes Hill Shopping Centre, which is my local shops, they set up this nativity scene, and you'll see that it's normally incorrect, right? So if you think of a nativity scene, you normally see something like this. You'll see, you know, the shepherds are there, you've got Joseph and Mary, and then you've got baby Jesus, and then you've got the uh, wise men. Sometimes they are depicted as kings, which they aren't, but you have them all under this roof, all this beautiful picture of the nativity scene, but it's actually not correct. Here's another one uh, where they're all here together admiring the baby Jesus, there, you know, we got the wise men visiting and also the shepherds. And even this one where, you know, they've really gone all out here, where they've got, you know, the, the shepherd, I think, are here. You've got the wise men presenting gifts. And you even have the angels there, you know, at the, uh, the stable, all looking at baby Jesus in the manger. Now, what is wrong with this picture? Well, there's a few things. One, we know that the wise men were not at the stable. So if you read through the story, you can see here in Matthew 2, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. So here is after Jesus is born. He's in the manger. Now they've moved into a house. This is when the wise men come looking for Jesus, following that star. You see in verse 11, when they would come into the house, right? So they're no longer in the stable. They saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. When they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense. So this uh, nativity scene where they're all together uh, is not actually accurate because the uh, wise men did not go to the stable. The shepherds came first, saw the baby Jesus, and then when they had moved in, probably when Jesus was a little bit older, you know, because he's in the house, they bow down before him. Uh, This is when the wise men visited so this is incorrect they're not all together right so not only that we see here that the 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 shepherds did come so here's where the shepherds right they've gone the um, they go and say let us now go even unto bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass which the lord hath um, you know done right so not only that so if you look at this nativity scene here Often angels are introduced into the nativity scene too. But if you read in the story in Luke, we see here after the angels came to the shepherds, it says here in verse 15, and it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us now go even unto Bethlehem. So this whole picture of the angels being there too is not actually accurate. So if you wanted a stable nativity scene, then you would just have Joseph, Mary, and the shepherds. 
if you want to, that would be the true nativity scene, right? Because that's where Jesus was born, right? Because the shepherds went to see him when he was born. The wise men came to see him after he was born. So not technically a nativity scene anymore because it's not the birth and the angels are not there. And also, I don't believe angels have wings, so that's not accurate either. You know, angels look like men, Okay, why is that? Hebrews 13, be not forgetful and entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. We, we know angels are not easily identifiable. They just look like human beings. And the last one I just want to talk about, I normally mention at Christmas, is, you know, this was very important because what the angels said to the shepherds, they said in verse 12, and this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. So it was very important that then we, we, they went there, the sign that they were given when they saw the baby Jesus, that he would be wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in the manger. So I think if we're going to represent the nativity scene, we should represent Jesus actually lying in the manger, like the Bible says. But here we have you know, Mary holding the baby up, out. at least he's in swaddling clothes. Uh, this one is the same. Uh, this one, you know, he is actually wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. But then you have other issues with this scene. This one, you know, sometimes you see in, uh, you know, uh, these in Catholic churches and sometimes people buy nativity scenes. You see Jesus here, you know, full head of hair, born. Uh, some babies are born like that, so that's not so much of a problem. But he's not wrapped up, right? You know, he's just lying there, you know, just with his undies on. So he should be wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And I always find this picture very, uh, very humorous because I have no idea what this is. I was looking up, you know, Jesus lying in a manger, and then I came across this picture. Uh, I don't know what that is. It looks like a dark skin baby Jesus. He's got like a halo around him, but he doesn't even have any clothes on. I don't know uh, what they were trying to do with that picture. Now, a bit of a word about traditions. Now, traditions are not a bad thing in and of themselves. I mean, tradition is a powerful thing, isn't it? I mean, tradition can reinforce both the right thing and the wrong thing. But traditions are not wrong in and of themselves. So just because something is a tra tradition, that doesn't mean it's wrong to do, right? There are traditions that are good and there are traditions that is bad, are bad. Because what is a tradition? A tradition is just a practice or a belief even that is passed down from generation to generation. So not all traditions are bad because, you know, you can think of biblical doctrine. That's a tradition, right, as we pass it down to our children. 2 Thessalonians 2, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistles. You see here they are passing on truth and saying, hey, pass them on. These are, this is a tradition. So the word tradition in and of itself is not a taboo word. right? Tradition is just something that is taught and practiced and passed down from generation to generation. Second Thessalonians 3. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us. See, so there was, a, there was an example that they were trying to set and they wanted that to continue and that was a tradition. Obviously, it was walking in the ways of the Lord. It was obeying the commandments, following the Bible. Now, you see here bad traditions in 1 Peter 1. Look at this. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. So we can see here that you can have vain traditions, traditions that have no meaning or the wrong meaning, making them vain, where they do them anyway. And he's saying here, look, you don't just blindly just keep following these traditions that are followed from your father, whereas it's, it's idolatry, which is what he's referring to here. Colossians 2, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain, there's that word again, deceit. So some traditions are actually deceitful. They trick people. They, they, they lie to people. So they're actually teaching a wrong thing. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Let's look at Mark 7. We see here the uh, Pharisees and the scribes, right? They, they're, they're following their tradition. Let's see what Jesus has to say about it. 
Then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain of the scribes which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say with unwashed hands, they found fault, right? So they have a problem with people eating and not washing their hands before they eat. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands off, eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. So this is a practice that was passed down, and they continue to wash their hands before they eat. And when they, and they, and when they, and, and when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things there be, which they have received to hold, as the washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels and of tables. So there was a whole bunch of different washings that they had received from the tradition of their fathers. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? So they had a problem with others not adhering to these additional practices that they had implemented for, the, for, uh, for, other, for themselves. Mark 7, verse 6. He answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoureth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So you can see here that they're just doing this practice, but it has nothing to do with God. Howbeit, in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines, as that word vain again, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, he hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things ye do. So see, this is where a tradition becomes a problem. A tradition becomes a problem when it makes you put aside the commandments of God, make the commandments of God a non effect by your tradition. Right? So either it's something that goes against the commandment of God or you think that tradition does something that replaces something you should be doing. And that's the problem that was here. Right? That's the problem that was going on here. Verse 9. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. For Moses said, Honour thy father and thy mother, and whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, If a man shall say to his father or mother, It is Korban. That is, to say a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such like things ye do. And when he had called all the people unto him, he said unto them, Hearken unto me, every one of you, and understand, there is nothing from without a man that entering in him can defile him, but the things which come out of him those are they that defile the man. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. So if you don't understand what's going on in this passage, you see the issue that the Pharisees had with people not washing their hands and the plates and the cups, it wasn't hygienic reason. So you might say today, ah, oh, you know, people, you know, they go, sometimes I'm at work, I don't know if you're at work sometimes, and you're like in the bathroom, and then like somebody comes in and uses the bathroom, and then they just go back out, and you're like, I didn't hear the tap go on. You know, <laughs> and they're like, you know, on the toilet, you know, or they're, you know, touching their junk, you know what I mean? So, some people have some hygienic practices that are a bit questionable, and, you know, I would take issue with that, but that's not necessarily sinful in and of itself, unless it gets out of hand. Obviously, God wants us to be clean people. This is not what's going on here. What's going on here is, yes, they have this practice, obviously which is hygienic as well, they have this practice of washing the cups and the plates and everything like that, but what they think is if they do that, then they will not be sinful, right? They're not going to get defiled. And whilst they keep that, thinking that they're being pure, and thinking that they're you know, not being sinful and all that, they are not adhering to actual commandments of God, right? Things that are actually defiling them. And this is why Jesus makes this point here, that when you eat things, you're not actually defiling yourself spiritually, right? When you eat things that are unclean or you eat things, different things, right? They don't defile you spiritually. Yeah, they may affect you physically, your physical body, right? But here he's making a spiritual statement that you're not being defiled. Because why? That which comes out of him, 
right? Because it comes from the heart, Jesus teaches. See, so the adulteries, the murders, the, the, the things that come out of you that are sinful, that ends up defiling your spirit, not the things you eat. So this belief that they were washing their hands and washing the cups and plates and thinking that was keeping them clean spiritually was false. At the same time, they thought that justified them from actually keeping a commandment of God. And the one he mentions here is honoring your mother and father. Why? Because they didn't do it. They had a tradition, right? And he's likening it to like the washing of the cups and the blades, this tradition that they do. And therefore, they think that they can just reject other commandments of God. And people often have this mindset today. You may have this mindset. You think, well, yeah, well, I get together with my family. We celebrate Christmas. We put up a Christmas tree. We do all that. And yet you don't come to church. You're not reading your Bible. You're not praying. You're not soul winning. You're not doing things that God has commanded us to do. And you think you're fine because you keep these traditions just that the world keeps, or these Christmas traditions. That may not be wrong in and of themselves. But do you think it somehow offsets doing something that God has commanded you to do, right? Then that's the problem that's being explained here, right? So we have three issues with traditions. One, they're vain. Well, they can be deceitful. Or if it's making the word of God of none effect by your tradition. And you know, when we talk about Christmas, you know, I have to mention, you know, this is where Santa Claus and the elves and the reindeers, it sits into this category. And in fact, it, it would apply to all these categories. So I believe Christians ought to have nothing to do with Santa Claus and the elves and Christmas. And, you know, why are people in Australia, you know, like my wife always says, she says, it funny, are people in Australia decorate their house with snow and put up snowmen and all that stuff? And it's like, are we so, we don't even have our own culture that we have to, you know, celebrate in a different hemisphere, you know, what Americans do, putting up snowmen and things like that, it obviously has nothing to do with the birth of Jesus Christ. And in fact, you know, so this is why when people celebrate, you know, through that sort of stuff, I think it's, one, is vain because it has nothing to do with Jesus. Two, it's deceitful because often a lot of parents will trick their children into believing Santa Claus is real dress up as Santa Claus, you know, put the gifts under the tree while they're sleeping, eat the milk and the cookies. And, you know, parents, I don't know why parents do this, and they still do this. There's a parent at jiu-jitsu where the kid was saying, oh, Santa Claus, and my kids were saying, you know, no, it's just your parents dressing up and eating <laughs> the cookies and the milk. But, you know, people, people are still lying to their children, thinking that, you know, uh, you know, Santa Claus is coming. They lie to their children about the Easter Bunny. They lie to their children about the Tooth Fairy. They lie to their children about all this. And you don't want to do that because you don't want your kids growing up thinking that you're not a source of truth, that you've been just, just deceiving them their whole life. So then when you talk to them about the things of God, you want them to believe you. You want them to have some respect for the things you say because the things you say are truthful. They're well thought out and they're right. So we don't want it to be deceitful, which is a lot of what uh, some people do when it comes to Santa Claus and all that stuff. And we don't want to make the, the word of God of none effect because oftentimes when people celebrate Christmas, like in school, they will, you know, I remember when I was in school, they would get kids to write out a list of things that they want and it's, it's all about materialism and the expectation of they're going to get all these gifts and write out all the things you've been lusting after you know, and encouraging that sort of behavior. So we have this tradition that we get kids to do write to some fake person that doesn't exist right, about all the things that they want, just thinking about them, rather than it being a selfless time thinking about others, thinking about the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is why traditions can make the word of God of none effect. And this is why Christians, you know, if you're going to celebrate Christmas, you know, make it about Jesus. And I, I really have a problem with Christians who want to do the right thing, but then, you know, you're still, if you're still buying, like, the Santa Claus hats and the elves costumes, like, you're spending God's money, on something that is vain, deceitful, practices that make the word of God of none effect. You know, we don't want to fuel that industry, right? So the reason why people sell those things is because they know a Christian is going to go out there and buy it all. Right? You know, if they made all these Santa hats and nobody bought them, they'd probably stop making them, right? Because nobody would want to buy them. So keep that in mind as you celebrate Christmas this year. If you celebrate Christmas... Uh, the way a lot of people do traditionally, then make it about Jesus. Point people to Jesus, point your kids to Jesus, remind people about that. 
So some objections when it comes to celebrating Christmas. And really, you know, there are people out there that talk about Christmas being pagan and we shouldn't do all those things. I want to talk about those different aspects and uh, why I believe it is uh, not biblical to just, you know, talk about making everything pagan. First of all, let's talk about the date. The date. So the 25th of December. Is it wrong to celebrate Christmas on the 25th of December? Is it wrong to take one day out of the year to say, hey, we're going to honour the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ and remember where Jesus Christ came, the incarnation. The incarnation is a very big deal in the Bible, obviously, so it's not that the incarnation is a small deal. It's a fulfilment of prophecy. It's when the Word was manifest in the flesh. It was the start of the fulfilment of all the prophecies. When Jesus entered into the world, and there was prophecy around how he was going to be born, his name, all that sort of stuff, where he was going to be born. This is why when the wise men came and they asked, where is he going to be born? They knew where he was going to be born. Why? Because it was prophesied. So we read in Mark, uh, Matthew and Luke how the parents ended up getting to there, right? Getting to Bethlehem in order for Mary to give birth to Jesus. So it's all very interesting, uh, you know, how God, even though we have complete free will, God can still work all things to fulfill prophecy. And there's, there's a lot of theories out there about how that can work. But um, I think whatever theory we hold to, or whatever position you hold to, to meet those two things, where God can control certain things, we don't want to affect the fact that we have free will. Right? So God has control over things if he wants to. He can give us free will, but he can make sure things happen without affecting our free will. So 25th of December. Now, was Jesus Christ born on the 25th of December? Uh, if you believe he was, I'm sorry to burst your bubble this morning, but he was not. He was not born on the 25th of December. Um, you know, this is one thing, you know, if, we, if we're going to celebrate Christmas and tell our kids about it, don't, you know, raise them thinking that this is the birthday of the Lord Jesus Christ. No, this is just the day that is used to remember the birthday of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in fact, a lot of people believe it's not possible for it to have been on the 25th of December because at that time of the year, it is winter, and therefore the shepherds would not be outside tending to their flock. So they think it's probably going to be sometime in the northern hemisphere's summer, or you know, sometime it was a bit warmer for them to be outside minding their flock. Luke 2 8. They were in the same country, shepherds abiding in the field. So you see, it was warm enough for them to stay outside, keeping watch over their flock by night. So winter in December would have been too cold for the shepherds to be out. So a lot of people think it's actually the wrong time of the year. So where does this date come from? Well, you know, the, the history is that there was a pagan uh, day of worship on the 25th of December to worship the sun god. But then when Emperor Constantine took over and he made sort of what is now known as the Catholic Church, the Christianity as the state religion, they changed re re uh, celebrating or worshipping the pagan god of the sun, or the sun as a god, to remembering the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why, historically, the date was changed. It was repurposed to now be a Christian holiday rather than a pagan holiday. And you say, well, should we, should we use that day? If pagans did something on that day, why don't we select a different day? Well, the question is, well, do, do pagans own the dates on which they celebrate their pagan holidays? Like, if pagans do something on one day, does that mean nobody else is allowed to use that day anymore? And if you use that day, now you are a pagan because you've used that day? But the thing is, you know, there's only 366 possible dates in the year. I'm sure there are things happening by pagans all over the world that you don't know about that are happening on certain days of the year you know, does that mean you're not allowed to celebrate? You're not allowed to repurpose that date because if somebody finds out that that's what it was used for and now you've repurposed it, you're just continuing to follow a pagan tradition because you're using the same date. Do you see how that does not logically follow? Just because pagans did something on a day, that doesn't mean they're the only ones that are allowed to use it, right? We can use the day too. It was like, Think about it. It's like a building. If a building used to belong to some Muslims and they moved out, they sold it, it's repurposed, it's just a regular looking building, you want to use it, now it's used to have church and preach the, God, you know, preach the Bible, sing hymns to God. Is there anything wrong with that? 
No, because it's being repurposed. It's being repurposed for the right thing. If anything, it's a good thing. It should repurpose all the days. Every day should be a day where we consider the Lord Jesus Christ and we worship the Lord. You know, worship ought to be a lifestyle. You know, don't come to church thinking, well, I'm going to church, that's when I worship. No, worship should be your lifestyle. You're just coming to church to praise God in song. But everything you do in your life should lift up the Lord. Everything you do, whether you eat or drink, you do all to the glory of God. So you see how every part of your life, every day, ought to be an act of worship, lifting up the Lord, doing things with God at the forefront of your mind. It's not only something you do at church. So, like I said, you have people out there, you know, can't celebrate Christmas, Easter, New Year's, you know, they talk about that being, I'm sure... I'm sure there are people out there. I mean, I don't know them. I'm sure there are people out there thinking, celebrating the first day of the year, like a New Year's, as probably pagan in some way. Um, and you know, I like to make this point because, see, this is why I, I understand there are conspiracy theories out there. I'm not a person that rejects all conspiracy theories. There are conspiracies out there, and a conspiracy is just people in high places, people behind closed doors, making plans that affect everyone and they're conspiring to implement plans, right? And there's obviously this is what we're trying to, to fight. But we have to understand not everything is a conspiracy. Some things are just coincidental. But why, when you watch, like, say, a conspiracy theory video on YouTube, are they able to tie so many seemingly unrelated things together so easily, right? And people watch it and they're like, wow, like, yeah, that's so coincident. This is that and this and that. And it's just like crazy how they all tie together. Why is it? Because think about this, guys. And I've, I've talked on this before, but I just I think it's very important because when you watch a lot of these videos on YouTube, you, you need to be able to discern what is an actual conspiracy and what is just somebody just making up stuff, putting numbers into some numerology chart, just looking, finding numbers everywhere. Why, but why does it work? Because there are only so many numbers in the world. Because right? every number, you think about it, it's made of 10 digits. Right? Zero to nine. Every number is made up of those digits. Right? So there's only so many numbers in the world right? that can be used. And then when you think about shapes, geometric shapes, there's only so many geometric shapes in the world, like basic ones. Right? We're not talking about polygons. Like polygons, you can have an infinite number of those, but you think like you've got circles, triangles, you've got squares or rectangles, you've got a star, you've got you know, some basic shapes, you know, the stuff that we teach our children when we're teaching them shapes. So this is why they're able to just link them all together because it's so easy to find commonalities when there's not that many different numbers and not that many different shapes. So. I, I use this example just as a, just being facetious, right? But people will say, ah, look, here I can prove... This is just an example. I'm not saying anyone's actually using this argument. But an example might be, ah, you know, Christmas, they talk about three wise men. And they say, like, if you have two threes, that's like the Illuminati. You know, 33. And I'm sure if I had a clock in here and I happened to be preaching this at, like, you know, 11, 06, at 33 seconds, it's like, ah, he just happened to mention that point. At 33 seconds, and you know, if we multiply three by two, we're going to get a six. And if you have three sixes, that's six, six, six. Ah, you see how Christmas is satanic? So people just do this stuff, and you'll see it. I've seen so many videos. People have sent me videos before, and it's just like uh, talking about the, the guy getting, you know, the guy that ran people over in, uh, in Melbourne, I think. Where was it? He ran over, and I remember saying, like, one of the guys that actually was killed was somebody I knew, right? He was the older brother of a family I knew in Perth. I used to play badminton with them. There was three brothers, and the oldest brother, his name was Matthew, he was one of the people that got run over by that car. He worked in the CBD in, um, was it Melbourne? I can't remember where it was. I think it was Melbourne. So anyways, like, then people are saying to me, like, oh, you know, when, when they all come out, oh, it's all conspiracy, it didn't happen, false flag. Now, am I saying that it wasn't some sort of planned thing to do things? And Maybe, right? Maybe there, somebody planned it, it wasn't just some random crazy person running through. Either way, it doesn't matter. But when people start saying things like, oh, the people that were killed in the car crash weren't actually killed, I'm like, 
but I, I know one of the guys that was killed. I know the family's like grieving in Perth. They went to his funeral. Are you saying he doesn't exist? Like they went to his funeral, he died. Right? And then they started saying, well, he was 33 years old. Why did they kill somebody that was 33 years old? Oh, Illuminati, right? What were the chances? Three people killed, 33? Oh, it's just, sometimes it's a little bit outrageous, you know? And I've seen videos as well where they just plug random numbers into some numerology generator, and those numbers mean something, and therefore, it's just like, just don't get duped by those things. But also, don't swing the other way and just think, there are no conspiracies going on. There definitely are people working in our places, doing things, but we just want to be wise about what we call a conspiracy and what we don't, because you know what? We don't want to be called crazy just uh, you know, following what ultimately amounts to numerology and uh, thinking that we're proving something from the Bible. All right, the second one. So that's the first one, the date. Celebrating on the 25th of December, using 25th of December to remember the birth of the Lord Jesus does not make celebrating Christmas in and of itself pagan, right? It's, you're not bowing down to anything like that, but this is where they'll get you. They'll say, yeah, but you decorate a Christmas tree. And I just found it funny. Uh, Lewis probably, and Steph are probably knowing about the comment I'm talking about on Facebook. <laughs> he said, there was one guy on Facebook, because around this time of year, everyone's out in force saying, ah, you pagan celebrating Christmas, right? And I'm, I, like I said, I'm not even a big proponent of Christmas. I just don't like bad arguments. And I don't, I don't want anyone at church using bad, argu by, bad arguments either. But I saw this comment on Facebook where they're talking about Christmas trees and the guy said, every morning even, they're kneeling down before the Christmas tree, you know, worshipping this idol. And I'm just thinking... Surely people are kneeling down at the Christmas tree because they're opening their presents, you know. So if you have such a problem with it, just get a chair. You don't have to kneel. You can open your presents in a chair. But, uh, you know, do I do the Christmas tree? I don't do the Christmas tree. But, you know, I have a problem with people that want to do the Christmas tree and teach their children a bit about Christmas as they decorate that tree. I don't have a problem with that. You know, you want to have a tradition that points people to Jesus, you know, go ahead. But, you know, make it about Jesus. You know, if you're going to do a tradition to talk about Jesus, make it about Jesus. But what I don't believe is decorating a Christmas tree leading up to the 25th of December is in and of itself pagan. Now, why do people believe it's pagan? Well, they try and use Jeremiah 10, and this is a very important passage for you to know if you, uh, you know, want to, you know, decorate a Christmas tree, you should probably know this passage because this passage will probably be told to you one day by somebody who thinks celebrating Christmas is wrong. Jeremiah 10, let's uh, read through it and we'll show, I'll show you why it's not talking about a Christmas tree, but also why people think it's talking about a Christmas tree. Jeremiah 10, hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven. For the heathen are dismayed at them. See, it's like, hey, you don't want to do these vain traditions of the unbelievers. Right? For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth the tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver and gold, and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. So you see, if you were to just read verses 3 and 4, you may get the picture in your mind, wow. Is this talking about a Christmas tree? Because I know today, you know, I don't buy a real Christmas tree. I just buy this plastic thing and I just put it up and sometimes I leave it there and don't even put it away. Sometimes I just there, I just cover it. And in October, I uncover it. It's always there. So I'm like, I'm not cutting a tree. I'm just putting this plastic ornament there. But, you know, traditionally, people will cut a tree out of the forest and they'll bring it into their home and then they'll decorate it and things. And you think, oh, wow, is that... That talking about Christmas trees, that sound, really sounds like cutting a tree out of the forest. And we think, well, they decorate it. They deck it with silver and with gold. Like, I deck the balls with bells of holly. La, 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 la. So this is why people turn to Jeremiah 10. Because they think, Jeremiah 10, man, that's talking about a Christmas tree. But we go on. If we read the whole passage, and if you're familiar with this passage, you'll know it's obviously not talking about a tree. It's talking about an idol. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. Right? Now, people don't even do that with Christmas trees. Generally, they will put it into a pot or something, and then they may have to move it around the house and whatnot. So it's saying here it's fastened, that it can't move. 
Verse 5, they are upright as the palm tree. Now this is what is called a simile. A simile is when you say something is like this, right? Victor is skinny as a rake. I used to get that all the time. You know, so you might use other similes. Now, would it be silly to say something like Victor is as skinny as a skinny person? You wouldn't just compare something to something that is it, right? So if this is a tree that is decorated, why would it be likened to a tree? Right? That'd be pretty silly to say a tree stands up like, upright like a tree, right? Because it's not a tree. That's why they turned this tree, they've cut it out of the forest, they've turned it into something else by decking it with gold and silver, actually coating it, right? You think about a, a, an idol. They fasten it down so it doesn't move. They are upright as the palm tree. What is upright as the palm tree? The idol, right? They stand up like a tree, but it's not a tree, otherwise it wouldn't make sense to use that simile. But speak not. So you see they have a mouth and they don't speak, right? Because they've carved it out to be an idol, to be an image of something that you know, may have arms and legs and mouth and eyes and whatnot, like the Bible talks about. They must needs be born because they cannot go. What is that talking about? They need to be carried because they can't move themselves. Now, people don't walk around carrying their Christmas tree. They carry it to where they've got to put it and they leave it there, right? It's not made to be carried around, right? It's made to just sit in one place. So if you think about these idols being carried around, you think about, you know, those religions like the you know, Catholic and Orthodox where they are carrying around. I think it's more mainly Catholic. You know, they, they're carrying around this thing on a platform, right? And they're all worshipping it. And uh, I'm sure you've seen all those funny videos where somebody like drops them and the, the thing just comes crashing down and they're all like wailing like, oh, you know. And uh, I always find those uh, quite humorous. Because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil. Neither also it is in them to do good. For as much as there is none like unto thee, O Lord, thou art great, and thy name is great in might. So you see how whatever they're making is replacing God. Because he's saying, there is none like unto thee, O Lord. Thou art great, and thy name is great. Now I will say this, if you're putting up a Christmas tree and worshipping it like it's God, then you are in sin. Right? So it's not that the Christ decorating a tree is wrong, it's the idolatry. Right? If you are worshipping the tree, obviously that's wrong. Most people that decorate a Christmas tree uh, are not actually worshipping the tree, right? They're just decorating it. Verse 7, Who would not fear thee, O king of nations? For to thee doth it appertain. For as much as among all the wise men of the nations and in all their kingdoms there is none like unto thee. But they, what is it talking about? The idols, are altogether brutish and foolish. The stock is a doctrine of vanities. Silver spread into plates is brought from Tarshish and gold from Euphaz. So this is not putting on something on the tree that is representing gold and silver. This is actually silver and gold because why they're making this idol actually fancy and expensive. Getting this silver and gold, gold from Euphaz, silver from Tarshish, they're spreading it into plates. Why? So they can plate. You know, you think about plating something. That's why it's spreading it into plates. is brought from Tarshish and gold from Euphaz. The work of the workmen and of the hands of the founder Blue and purple is their clothing. You see, and nobody's putting a t-shirt onto a Christmas tree. Nobody's putting clothing on it. There's clothes on these idols. Why? Because they make them into the similitude of humans sometimes. They are all the work of cunning men. I like just to point out here that to make an idol requires some skill to plate it, clothe, make the clothing for it, but you know, decorating a Christmas tree requires no skill. You put it up, you get your children to help you decorate. People just throw everything on there and they decorate it. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and an everlasting king. At his wrath the earth shall tremble and the nation shall not be able to abide his indignation. Thus shall ye say unto them, the gods, right? Here you go, the gods, little g, that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth. From under these heavens he hath made the earth by his power, he hath established the word by his wisdom, and hath stretched out the heavens by his discretion. When he uttereth his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens, and he causeth the vapours to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings with rain, and bringeth forth the wind out of his treasures. Every man is brutish, that means uh, stupid, 
Every man is brutish in his knowledge. Every founder is confounded by the graven image, for his molten image is falsehood. There is no breath in them, right? They're not alive. They are vanity and the work of errors. In the time of their visitation, they shall perish. The portion of Jacob is not like them. That's our God. For he is the former of all things, and Israel is the rod of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. You see, it is describing people making an idol. It is describing people worshipping this idol and putting it in the place of God. And this passage is saying, your idol will not replace the God of heaven. So is a Christmas tree painting? Think about the things people do when they decorate a Christmas tree. You say, well, are trees pagan? You say, well, tr- you know, pagans, they worship in the grove. Well, do pagans own trees? Are they the only one that is allowed to have plant life in their home? Like, is a believer no longer allowed to have plant life in their home because pagans do it? You know, these are the sort of things you've got to think about. Like, am I doing, you got to think when you do something, am I actually doing anything sinful in and of itself? What actually makes it sinful? What would make it sinful is if you actually are committing idolatry. What makes it idolatry is when you bow down and worship the thing that you have made, not just the fact that you are making something. Are decorations pagan? Are pagans the only one allowed to decorate plant life? Are pagans the only one allowed to put lights on plant life? You know, putting lights on the outside of your house. You know, is that pagan? People will say, you put these decorations on your tree and they're in circles. And don't you know, circles are a pagan symbol. And that's the thing, do pagans own the circle? Do they own the triangle? I mean, to me, I thought it was just balls of gold, just representing the gold that was given to Jesus. But... You know, people say, people say the star at the top, you know, that's a pagan symbol. People say, but people are saying you know, it's the, the star that the wise men followed, or like a gold, the wise men gave gold. So you can see as you break it down, it's not sinful in and of itself. What would make it sinful is if it's deceitful, if it's vain, like making the word of God by none effect of your tradition. You know, it's like if you were to skip church on Sunday morning. Let's say Christmas fell on a Sunday and you skip church on Sunday morning to open presents under your Christmas tree, there you go. That's making the word of God of none effect, right? So that's the problem, right? And if anyone is actually worshipping their tree, which I don't think most people do, that obviously is idolatry, and that would be sinful. But having the tree in and of itself is not wrong. You see, making a graven image and a molten image is not wrong in and of itself, right? You've got to understand this. See, God commanded... Moses to make a brazen serpent, a molten image of a serpent, right? It wasn't sinful in and of itself. It actually represented Jesus dying on the cross, you know, the sin being hung up on the cross. There were molten images and graven images in the temple of God, right? And even in uh, the tabernacle, right? The problem is, is when they worshipped it, when they worshipped that serpent on the stick, you know, they even sometimes treated the Ark of the Covenant like an idol, right? So it's not what it's bowing down to the idol, right? Worshipping the idol in and of itself, not having something that represents something else, right? Now, the last one I just want to touch on briefly is sometimes people will say about Christmas, you know, gift giving is pagan. And I just leave this last because it's absolutely absurd. I mean, if you were to think about it, but I've heard this. I've heard this argument saying, uh, you know, that's what the pagans do. The unbelievers do. That's what they do. They give gifts and whatnot. And the Bible actually says that you shouldn't give gifts and take your gift. Does the Bible actually talk about it? Well, these are the verses that they go to to try and say these things. And they're absolutely outrageous. I mean, these are, these are the worst argument I've ever heard. Um, and not many people do it, but I have heard it. Exodus 23. It says here in verse 8, And thou shalt take no gift, for the gift blindeth the wise and perverteth the words of the righteous. So it doesn't necessarily say, hey, it doesn't say give a gift. I'm giving the gift. It says, uh, don't take a gift. But is that even what it's talking about? When it says take no gift, is it wrong? Is it okay to give gifts? But who are you going to give them to? It's a sin to receive gifts. Right? So what, are they, what, is it, what is the Bible actually talking about here? Because we know if people use this verse to say, ah, you see, the Bible says, uh, thou shalt take no gift. This is a similar argument to somebody saying the Bible says there is no God, you know, using Proverbs, uh, Psalms 14.1. So what is this talking about? Well, if you read the second part of the verse, you can see it's talking about taking bribes, taking too many gifts where it would cloud your judgment. 
right? And even in the corporate world, they understand this, that if you're like a sales rep, if you're somebody that has to make important decisions and suppliers or businesses are trying to buddy you up by giving you bribes, but you know, in the form of gifts, you know, a lot of companies will have uh, policies in place where if gifts are over a certain amount, you need to declare, you have to reject them, you're not allowed to accept them because they know it's going to affect your judgment when it comes to doing honest business deals, right? And doing what's best for the company rather than what's doing what's best for you, right? There's a conflict of interest there. It's the same with judgment. You're meant to, as a judge, they're meant to be doing what's right by God, what's right by justice, not what benefits them. So we don't want this conflict of interest where they're taking these bribes. Deuteronomy 16, 19. Thou shalt not rest in judgment. Thou shalt not respect persons. Neither take a gift, for a gift doth blind the eyes of the wise and pervert the words of the judgment, of the righteous. Now what's silly is, if we were to say giving gifts is sinful, I mean, God is the one that gives the gift. I mean, that's why we celebrate Christmas. We, we remember the gift of God, which is Jesus Christ as he came into this life, the ultimate gift. This is the reason why people give gifts and they say, hey, it's a practice of giving gifts because God gave us the ultimate gift. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 2 Corinthians 9. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Now, pagans do, and unbelievers, do celebrate by giving gifts. But like we talked about with the other traditions, are they the only ones that are allowed to do that? And because they do it, nobody else is allowed to do it when it's a practice that is not necessarily sinful. In fact, it's a good thing to do, to give people gifts, right? To be generous. Revelation 11.10, this, this is one thing. This is in the end times where they kill the two witnesses, and they're happy. So they're celebrating that these two witnesses, which a lot of people believe are Moses and Elijah, are no longer there to torment them, right? Because fire came out of their mouths, right? And devoured them sometimes if they tried to kill them. Verse 10, And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry. You see here, merry Christmas. And shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. But if you remember last week when we talked about the book of Esther, we also see here where God's people also celebrated by giving gifts. Right? They repurposed the day, which is a day of destruction. They turned it into a day of celebration on the 13th day of the 12th month. Esther 9.20, Mordecai wrote these things and sent letters unto all the Jews that were in all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus, both nigh and far. To establish, to establish this among them, that they should keep the 14th day of the month, Adar, and the 15th month, 15th day of the same, yearly, as the days where the Jews rested from their enemies, and the month which was turned unto them from sorrow to joy, and from mourning into a good day, that they should make them days of feasting and joy, and look, and of sending portions one to another, and gifts to the poor. Now, did did Mordecai do something wrong here? Was it wrong for him to change what? 13th, 14th, and 15th of the 12th month. And what that month used to represent, which was victory over God's people, right? The pagans making this day where they would celebrate, where they would you know, go and kill and exterminate God's people. But they repurposed that day. They repurposed that month to say, hey, this is now a day where we celebrate. It was a great victory. right? So yeah, maybe one day, the 25th, was a pagan holiday, but now it represents something, you know, to do with God, which I think is a good thing. But you know, whether we do it or not, it's up to you. You know what I mean? I, I think it's up to you whether people cre keep Christmas or not, and practice it in the way people do. But you need to understand that it is not a biblical mandate. And oftentimes I've had people ask me who are not Christians or Muslims ask me, like, you celebrate, don't celebrate, you don't celebrate Christmas. How can you not celebrate Christmas? You're a Christian. You don't celebrate Christmas. I do to some extent in the sense that, you know, it's a time where we do remember. You know, I preach sermons like this. You know, sometimes I give things out. But um, I personally don't make a big deal of it in my family. You know, we don't do the tree and all that um you know we just use these days just by convenience really because it's already public holidays uh 
Gifts are a good thing, but what I do not like about holiday gifts is, you know, I just don't like money being wasted. Do you know what I mean? I think we should be good stewards of our money, and oftentimes the traditions overtake the practice of good stewardship, and people are just buying gifts for the sake of buying gifts, you know, and this is what I don't like. You know, we, we want a culture where we appreciate being given gifts, right? We like to give gifts. We appreciate when gifts are given. But what we need to stamp out is being offended when gifts are not given, right? Because it's that attitude that is driving this vain buying of gifts because you just don't want people to be offended. You don't want people to be, I can't do go there and not buy gifts. You know, like because it's the expectation of the person, right? It's the expectation of, oh, well, you know, because I know it happens in Asian culture all the time. Not with Christmas, because I don't really celebrate Christmas, but you know, Chinese New Year and all these things where it's like, how could you not invite them? They're going to be offended now. And they're all offended, and we have to make sure everyone's happy. So it's just people just buying things just to protect their own things. You can see how that becomes more about you, doesn't it? I had to buy people gifts because I'm worried what people will think about me. Does that have anything to do with the Lord Jesus Christ? No. So at least us, as Bible-believing Christians, let's make sure we do not have that attitude. You know, if people don't have a gift, if people don't, like it's like if some people come over to your house, they don't bring something, you invited them. This is why I like when people come to my house, I appreciate when people bring things. But if they don't, it's not like when they leave, I'm like saying to my kids and to my wife, like, oh, I invited them, I mean, bring something. How dare they come empty-handed? Who do they think they are? You know what I mean? Come over to my house, like, that's what I don't like. I've seen that attitude in my family, I've seen that attitude around the place. That's what I don't like about it. So give gifts by all means, appreciate gifts by all means, but do not get this me, me, me entitlement mentality where if you don't get a gift, it's like, how dare they? Do they not appreciate me? Well, that, all that stuff. You know, we ought to be humble. You know, we ought to not even expect anything. If we get something, that's more than enough. So I just want to end on Romans 14, because this is really the passage where the principle, when it comes to celebrating holidays these days, whether you honour it or not to the Lord, is really an issue of Christian liberty and of doubtful disputation. Romans 14. One man esteemeth one day above another, Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. All right, so you have the choice. If you want to do it, you do it. If you don't want to do it, you don't do it. If you think one day is worthy to honour the Lord, then you do it. If you think every day is the same, every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day, to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. So this might be somebody who's creating a feast. You know, if some people do it, they want to celebrate the Lord. Some people don't have a feast on that day, and it's fine either way. So in closing, if you're going to celebrate Christmas, and you're going to make it about Jesus, then make it about Jesus. But one thing is for certain. Santa, the elves, snowman, reindeer, that has nothing to do with Christmas. So let's try and stamp that out of our Christmas practices. Let's make it about the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for coming, being born for us. Thank you that during this time, Lord, there's uh, still a hint of Christian culture in these secular nations. So we thank you, Lord, at least there's this time where it's maybe easier to talk about the things of God with our loved ones. So we pray, Lord, we take that opportunity where we can. We Help us to be a good testimony. And we thank you, Lord, especially for your gift of eternal life through the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that we will be more like him. And uh, not only this time, but all throughout the year. We, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.